It's my honor and pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Not only is he from Kent, he's my son, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, a lot of you know him in this room, but you may not know that at birth he almost died. He was rushed to Children's Hospital, and for the first three days as Carolyn was recovering, I was the only person that bonded with him. Now I tell you this to tell you something else. Over the next five years, every time he was sick, he ran to me. And I got sick. <laughs> Nothing was happier than when he was like six years old and went to his mom for the first time. That was a good day. Ryan's been very active his whole life. Through high school, he was five years in the marching band. As a senior, he was the field commander. He now participates in the marching golden flashes at Kent State University. Not only that, his senior year, he put together a huge event for the prom for Teen Institute, which is Teens Against Alcohol and Drugs. He brought together the Sheriff's Department, the Brimfield Police, I believe the Highway Patrol was there. They had a mock scene. He brought in the helicopter, ambulances, the coroner, and they did a crash and all for free. He did everything for his school for that. It was a proud thing and I'm very proud to say that not one student was killed that year at prom. And he did a great job. The principal stopped and said, I wish I would have had everyone in the district here today to see this. He's been on the Dean's List two of the three years he's been in college, and or two of the three semesters, I'm sorry, he's a sophomore, he looked at me really weird. Uh, feels like three years, yes. Uh, when he was 16, he joined the Explorers He's wanted to be a fireman his whole entire lifetime. And he just finished his training for EMT and took his national registry test yesterday and passed. So he is an EMT. And he will be taking his firefighter card here soon. Um, he took 19 credit hours this semester to make sure he got his EMT done also. I have to say though, the greatest day that we've had together is the day he decided to give himself to the Lord. Amen. He chose a little later in life than what most kids that grow up in the church do. But he, when he made that decision, it was a decision that was very much in his heart. And he has done nothing but charged straight forward since then. He has never spoke before from the pulpit. This is his first time. Uh, I see he's rubbing his knees. <laughs> he asked, Dad, what, I'm speaking on this, what do you think? And I started rattling stuff off. He said, wait a minute, I'm driving, I can't take notes. <laughs> so, but I said, I'm not going to help you out, I'm going to let you do it. Because I know you can. And I trust him. I am very, very proud of my son and what he does. And I just can't say enough how lucky I am to be his father. Amen. And I'm very thankful for that. Now, without any farther ado, my son, Ryan Evans. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank you all for this opportunity this morning. And I want to thank you men of this congregation for pushing me into it <laughs> when Steve asked me uh, I didn't know what to think I was like I've never spoke before but why do you want me to speak he goes well we're having a bunch of young men and you're the only young person of our church so I want you to do it and I said well I guess I don't have much of a choice I guess I'm gonna do it and so then after I agreed to do it my heart kind of sank I didn't know what I was gonna talk on I then stumbled across my topic and I seen it in a Bible catalog and I was like, ooh, that sounds like a sermon. So I'll go ahead and write a sermon on it. So my topic this morning is welcome to the FBI. 
Now, well, probably when you think of the FBI, you think of something like this. They're guys in suits, ties, briefcases. They look like they're ready to get the job done. Well, I'm not talking about them. Or you might think of this. They really look like they're going to get the job done. They're coming to get you when you're doing wrong things and carrying all these big guns and all that. Well, I'm not going to talk about that either. This morning, I'm going to talk about something that we as Christian men need to be. And that is a faithful Bible investigator. Amen. Christian men have a huge responsibility, which includes leading the church as preachers, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, song leaders, and many other positions. Christian men also need to teach the gospel of Christ, and eventually they need to lead their families to Christ and teach them in a way they should go. As Proverbs 22, verse 6 reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If we as Christian men aren't solid in our faith, we have the possibility of leading many other people astray, which we will be held accountable for, like 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5 reads, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is why we need to be members of the FBI. Today I'm going to talk about how do we become members of the FBI, and then I'm going to look at the life of Saul, who later became Paul, and look at his example, and then we're going to look at the life of Peter. So how do we become a member of the FBI? I'm going to give us three steps that we need to follow to be in the part of the FBI. The first step comes from our text in John chapter 3 verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. The first thing we need to do to become an FBI member is decrease ourselves, our own wants, our own thoughts, and our own actions so that God gets the increase through the examples of our lives. The song we just sang before the lesson was entitled, None of Self and All of Thee. I want us to examine the words of this song to see if we see John 3.30 at work. Verse 1 reads, Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be, when I proudly said to Jesus, All of self and none of thee. We all have a time in our lives where we think we don't have time for God to work in our lives. We think that we aren't good enough to be part of his family, and we put many idols in front of him. Some of these idols could be money, work, sports, TV, video games, whatever it may be. But we put it before God and we're not decreasing ourselves. At that point in our lives, we are failing to be faithful and Bible investigators because of our own selfishness. Verse 2 of the song reads, Yet he found me, I beheld him on the bleeding, I, I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. This point in our lives may be a point where we begin searching for God, but we're not ready to give up our selfish actions yet. We don't think that we can give up the things that we think will make us happy. We don't know what true happiness is at that point. Verse 3 reads, Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. At this point, we have almost reached the point in our lives where we fully give up ourselves and we turn to Jesus to put him first. But we have, still have something in us that's pulling us back and saying, hold on, wait a minute, you're not ready. Verse 4, I really want us to pay attention to verse 4. I think it's the key verse for us as Christians and we should be striving to be at verse 4 and keep our mind on that goal. We, and we will get, always get up when we fall, but it's how we get up when we fall. We need to keep on keeping on, as Jim Mowder would say. Amen. Verse 4 reads, Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered, none of self and all of thee. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 reads, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful verse. That verse is what our goal is while on earth. There are ways to incorporate God into part of our daily lives without suffering loss in our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 reads, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When we realize that it's not about us, then we have put God as the ruler of our lives. 
the first step to becoming a member of the FBI is allowing God to become the ruler of our life and taking yourself from the driver's seat. The second step of, to becoming a member of the FBI comes from John chapter 8, verse 32, which reads, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How are we supposed to know the truth if we aren't investigating what God's Word actually says? Amen. I want us to look at the definition of investigation or investigating so that we are on the same page of what we as Christian men are should be doing. <clears throat> Webster defines investigate as to observe or study by close examination and systematic inquiry. <clears throat> if you went to the doctor's office and for something wrong, you wouldn't want the doctor to tell you that he's going to investigate the problem and only look at it once and or not look at it all and say that he knows exactly how to fix it and what he's going to do. Why are we so quickly to say that we're investigating God's word, but we don't spend time closely examining every word of the Bible? Sometimes one word can change the entire meaning of a sentence. You can read the Bible through a million times and never heard something before and you find a new perspective that you may never thought of before. The second step to becoming a faithful Bible investigator is truly investigating God's Word for ourselves. The third step to becoming a member of the FBI comes from Acts chapter 17 verse 11 and that reads, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the Word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Do you know God's word well enough that you can find out those people who are trying to twist it like Satan was doing to the uh, Jesus when he was tempting him in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11? I want us to turn over and read that. Matthew 4 starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him on exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to them, All these things I will give to you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Satan sometimes knows the scriptures better than we do. That's why we need to be a member of the FBI. He's good at his job. We need to be in the scriptures daily, like the first century church was in Acts. As we read, the first church received the word with all readiness. They wanted to receive it, so they could read it and study it. We should want to study the Bible daily. It shouldn't be a burden. Amen. Let's turn over and read Ephesians chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. This passage is going to tell us the armor that we need to have on to be able to fight against the devil. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For do, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breast, breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which 
you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Is your armor strengthened for battle, or is it rusty and full of holes that you can easily be overcome with? Investigating the Bible daily will help to strengthen that armor. It will help to patch those rusty holes. The third step to becoming a member of the FBI is searching the scriptures daily and daily fighting against the devil. So now that we've looked at the three steps to becoming a faithful Bible investigator, I want us to look at the lives of Peter and Paul to see if they were truly members of the FBI. So let's begin with the life of Saul, who later became known as Paul. We read in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, what kind of man Paul was before he became a member of the FBI. Acts chapter 26, verse 9 reads, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Saul was a man that was known for persecuting Christians and persecuting the church. He believed what he was doing was right. But however, when he found out what he was doing was wrong, he quickly repented and changed his ways and was converted to be a member of the church. We see in the first couple verses of Acts chapter 9 that then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So the next couple verses is where Saul came to realize what he was doing was wrong. Continue reading in verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And when he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Into the, him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Can you imagine the Lord telling you that you got to suffer a lot of things for his name's sake? Paul had done just the opposite of this the rest of his life. He had been making Christians su uh, suffer for his sake, but now it, it was his time to suffer for God and for the things that he had done. Verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as he came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. 
Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is a son of God. Acts chapter 13 goes on to tell us that Paul was going around preaching the word of God in many cities. Saul went from a man that was uh, persecuting the church to a man that was proclaiming the word of God and he has become one of the greatest gospel preachers ever known. According to Google, which I know everything's got to be true because it came off <laughs> Google, uh, Paul traditionally has 13 books of the Bible that he wrote down by inspiration of God. But modern scholars believe that he actually only wrote eight of these books, which are Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, and 1st Thessalonians. Paul's life goes to show you that no matter how messed up your life once was, you can change your life at any time and become a member of the FBI. When we look at the life of Paul after he was converted and began preaching the word of God, we see a man that is a God-fearing man who is a faithful Bible investigator. Paul shows us that spending our lives as members of the FBI is the best thing we can do. And there are many good things to the, that come to those who are faithful unto death. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 reads, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all he have loved. His appearing. That verse gives all of us as Christians hope. It gives us hope that we will inherit the crown of righteousness, but we have to keep the faith and run the race like Paul did. We will mess up, and God knows that. But it's how we pick ourselves up that matters the most. Chapter Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25 reads, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul knew that he was a sinner, but he knew he also had hope. He lived with a thorn in his side for the rest of his life, but that didn't stop him from being able to serve God fully. This is just another example of Paul showing us how to be true members of the FBI. Paul is one of the greatest examples there is in the Bible on how to live our lives as Christian men. So now that we have defined the three steps of becoming a member of the FBI and looked at the example of Paul, I want us to briefly look at the life of Peter to see what happens when we take control of our own lives and we're not being an FBI member. So Peter was an apostle of Jesus. Apostles were very close to Jesus and interacted with him daily. To me, how could there be a better spot? You're interacting with the living word of God every day of your life. That, that to me is the place to be. How could you not have faith when you're around God every day? So the first time we see Peter begin to take his life into his own hands is when he was in the boat with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Let's turn over and read that now. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So Peter began this first experience by testing Jesus to see if it was truly him. Jesus wasn't afraid to tell him it was him, so he commanded him to come out on the water. And after Peter began walking on the water is when he completely took his life over. He began to feel himself sinking, and he didn't know what to do. So he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus responded, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? How many times in our own lives do we think we know the best? I got this. No one can tell me what way I can do my things the best. <laughs> I don't need somebody to do it for me. Then all of a sudden when we get into trouble, we want God to come and rescue us from our wrongdoings. When we rely on Him and remain faithful and study His Word daily, we know that He will take care of us in those times of trouble. Peter was a good example of what happens when we take on, over our own lives. Let's look at another time when Peter thought he would, knew what he was doing was best, but it turned out that Jesus really did know what was best. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31 through 35 reads, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Uh-oh, Peter. Here we go. Starting to think you know what's best. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Little did Peter know, Jesus fully knew what he would do, but Peter didn't think he could lose his faith to a point of denying Christ. So let's jump down to verse 69 of this chapter of Matthew 26. Verse 69. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and whipped, wept bitterly. After realizing what he'd done, Peter went out and wept, because he knew he'd done exactly what Jesus told him he was going to do. He had lost his faith, but it's what we see next that we need to uh, live by in our lives. Losing his faith to Jesus, he went and grew his faith stronger to Jesus after that point. Peter had troubles in his life, in time where his faith had diminished to nothing. But after realizing that his faith diminished, it grew his faith stronger to God. We need to be like Peter in the sense that when we fall and our faith fails us, we get back up and grow our faith stronger to God. We need to grow our faith by studying His Word daily, like 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15 tells us. This verse will be from the King James Version. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Peter and Paul both had doubts, but they fought through those doubts and became great faithful men. God gave Peter the keys to the kingdom and, a, and said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. So together, through the lives of Peter and Paul, we can learn that by being faithful Bible investigators, we can live a life that is according to the will of God. We are going to face criticism, but if we are a member of the FBI, God gives us ways to get past those criticisms. Romans chapter 8 
Verse 31 reads, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Back up to verse 28. And we know that all things work together to those for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now I want us to turn and read 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Nat reads, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And finally, Matthew chapter 5 verse 10. Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 reads, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We won't be perfect. I can promise you that. But if we're not a member of the FBI, you don't have any hope. Because when you try to be perfect, you will give up because you mess up so much. If we don't read God's word and know that he knows that we're going to mess up and sin. I appreciate you for listening this morning. And God bless you for the way you listen. Thank you. Good job, Brian.